I still believe that South Africa needs smart people, not smart weapons. You know, it's, it's quite absurd that people who were in the government in 1994 are still there 30 years later. Mm. Cater okay, deployment is the evil twin of public procurement, the way it's been done. Mr. Roger Jardine, thanks for being here. Thank you. Two truths and a lie about you. Two truths and a lie. Um, I am a good chef. Okay. Um, I love reading. Mm -hmm. And I played rugby. I could have been a springbok in, in a different era. I feel like the chef one is the lie. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Like, huh? you could have been a... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, That's interesting. You could have been a good scrum half or yeah. Scrum half, I was a flank. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Flank in wow. eight. My gosh. I played school rugby provincial. Wow. And under 21. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, so definitely the chef thing was the lie, right? No. No. Okay. The flank was the lie. No. No, I wasn't okay. playing. I hope you read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hope so too. Yeah. <laughs> So is this where I now? Yeah, you can up? tell. Okay. You can... I I was a decent rugby player. Okay, yeah. But wow. I wouldn't have made the Springbok oh, team. Wow, okay. And in fact, my brother at my 50th birthday party, mm. he said to everyone, uh, I could have been a Springbok if I was a bit faster, a bit bigger, hmm. a bit more muscular, mm. a bit more courageous. <laughs> <laughs> and just, and, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> well, my one attempt to play rugby was for the under 15 D team at my school and the ball went very high. I was on the wing. Okay. I caught the ball and I thought I was doing a lot and I was running and sprinting and sidestepping. Um, and it turned out I was out of bounds the whole time. And yeah, I was teased at school yeah. for, right. So, so you and I both would probably have, we could have made a kind of springbok. Well, you went to St. John's, right? Yeah. Yeah, so let's not get now ahead of us. Now you've outed yeah. me as uh, <laughs> my revolutionary credentials are in the gutter. Yeah. Exactly. But I do cook. That's my past. That's time. interesting. Um, wow. It's a passion of mine. Very interesting. Um, okay. How and, did you... And my wife's an author, so I... Oh, you know, I know Crystal. part of our... Yeah. Yeah. How did you become interested in... In cooking? Yeah. I think, okay, this is my, this is my own theory. I'm one of four boys, mm. okay? And I'm the youngest. And so I was always with my mom in the kitchen. And um, I just developed a love for cooking hmm. with her, you know. And um, I, I sometimes think because of the social structure at the time, if I had a sister, hmm. would I still have hmm. developed that passion? Hmm. But I was very close to my mom. She turns 90 this year. Wow. And we still cook together. So that's where, where it evolved. And we love cooking and chatting and most people say we gossip in the kitchen when you say we're cooking. <laughs> Do you gossip? But that's where, that's where it comes from. Yeah. What does your mom make about your, your move into politics? You know, my... Have you gossiped in the kitchen about a lot, politics? A lot, <laughs> You know, my, my, my mom is quite a legend in our family. Um, mm -hmm. She's 90 this year and very, you know, she's in good shape for a 90-year-old. Mm. So, and mentally, cognitively, she's very sharp. So Great. I've, I've discussed in detail with her mm. the political options that I was considering. Mm. Um, and she had very profound advice mm. along the way. She was, a, she was a bit concerned because, look, I've been in the private sector for almost 25 years. You know? Sure. And um, she bore the brunt of my father's political activism. Mm. Mm. And so for her, that's something that lives with her. Mm. And... Um, when my dad came out of a particularly long stint in solitary confinement mm. um, in the 80s, everyone rushed to him and said, you know, what can you, how can we help you? Trying to sort of make it better for him. And he said to everyone, focus on your mother. She mm. actually took the brunt of this whole thing. Mm. So, so she has that and that she went through quite a few times. And she's also from that era and that generation that, sees things um, in a way that really gave us that good energy back then. So, so yeah, I cook with her and we talk about 
everything. Very, very mm. cool. Yeah. Very cool. Mm. Does your father, uh, did your father ever speak about his experiences in solitary confinement? Yeah, he did. In fact, interestingly enough, um, he was left on his own for weeks at a time was nothing but a Bible in his cell. Hmm. And he used to pride himself on being a socialist, you know, he used to. <laughs> and when he came out of one spell of detention, he hmm. put the Bible on the table and he said to all of us, he was a very funny guy. Hmm. He had a great sense of humor. And he put it down and he said, right, ask me anything. <laughs> <laughs> because he had been, he'd been through yeah. the Bible extensively. And I come from a very extended religious family. There's a lot of religiosity in my extended family, several pastors mm. on both sides. Mm. Um, so anyway, he was, in, he was in jail with just a, mm. a, a Bible in his cell. And um, I actually had a very interesting experience um, when we were setting up Change Start Now, just talking about my mm. dad. Mm. Um, I was meeting with a senior guy on security company just talking about our building and we are offices being set up and right at the end of the meeting he said I met your father and he was an older guy but mm. older I mean 50 something maybe but older mm. he said I knew your father and I said to him how did you know my father and he said I was the young constable who had to check on him in his prison cell every morning mm. and he said to me the thing that stuck with him was the humanity of my dad behind the mm. bars and him on this side. Mm. And that's how he he met. That's the circumstances. I mean, South Africa is quite a yeah. crazy place, right? Wow. I mean, I, I was so moved by the story. Um, actually, I mm. told my mom that night mm. that mm. I actually met somebody who was checking on him yeah. Um, yeah. while he was inside. That's incredible. Mm. I, I suppose there's... Apart from being a decent chef, there's another part of your life that a lot of people don't know um, about. So they know you as the as the chairperson of First Rand. I think that's fairly well known. But your life in government and particularly in respect of South Africa's nuclear weapons program and the role you played in a key moment in our history of the decision to dismantle the weapons, which was taken earlier, but then the decision to carry that through and, uh, you know, move towards an African nuclear weapon free zone. Um, talk to us about that moment in South African history and, you know, what do you think about South Africa's decision to give up nuclear weapons and whether in hindsight that was the right move? So at the time, we're now talking sort of early 90s, mm. um, the context at the time was that the OAU had already declared Africa should be a nuclear weapons free zone and the ANC subscribed to that. Um, we also saw concurrently what was happening in South Africa and the way the apartheid government were positioning nuclear weapons as a deterrent, mm. right? And is if anyone's interested in it, I mean, you've written up your PhD on this, so I should be asking you. <laughs> um, there was the testing, you know, or, or not, mm. <laughs> you know, in the South Atlantic in 1979, it was September, September 22nd, 1979, it's going back to mm. me. There was this flash and mm. lots of speculation, right? And um, there was also the uh, missile testing range in Arniston, I think Seymour Hirsch wrote about it and how it mirrored the same layout of a testing range in the state in Israel. Hmm. Okay. And there was a lot of denial about that, but the way there was credence given to the corporation was hmm. some of the visitors from Israel who were visiting that test site were filling in the guest books in the B and B's in town. Hmm. Beautiful B and B, food was nice, mm -hmm. you know, and they'd say where they were from. Mm. And I think Seymour Hirsch basically wrote about that. So it was a big part of the narrative around how the government was propping itself up to ward off, yeah. you know, the influence of the Soviet Union. And it became a proxy for that battle, that ideological battle. And the ANC was always clear on where it stood. Um 
in terms of this issue. Um, and at the time, leading up to or around that time, I co-authored a paper in the journal Foreign Affairs yeah. Yeah. on why South Africa gave up the bomb. Mm. Um, and I remember, okay, it was a, a while ago, um, I still believe that South Africa needs smart people, not smart weapons. Okay, I believe that. Um, and I'm not naive about national defense and all of those things. Um, but at the time, I felt quite strongly as part of what the ANC was saying, because I, I subscribed to that, yeah. that for us to move forward on a clear basis, we needed to dismantle those weapons and essentially be uh, abide by the Non-Proliferation Treaty in letter and in spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, there was another view mm. that these things were good. It provided leverage okay, in the world. Sure. And the threat of having a nuclear weapon that you could detonate when you felt like it, if you didn't get your way, there was this whole view um, that we should hold on to them. And I actually took a senior delegation to Pelindaba. Mm. Years later, I would become the chairman of the Atomic Energy Corporation. But in that period, I took a senior delegation there because we were talking about the future. Um, and some people thought it wasn't such a bad idea. Mm. Now, you ask me about that period. Mm. When I think of the issues that I've worked on, and I must also give a big shout out to Abdul Minty, who was Absolutely. leading... He was leading this thing yeah. in exile, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and became a global leader. And became a global leader on this issue. And I was just a young whippersnapper taking my lead from him and following the stuff, right? But mm. he he was the guy leading this thing. Um, and when I reflect on my journey, mm. one of the things that I feel deeply fulfilled about and most proud about is the small role that I played in the denuclearization of South Africa, mm, mm. because I, I cannot fathom uh, a situation where we had those weapons. There was also another debate, by the way, which was because um, F.W. de Klerk dismantled those weapons, right? Six and a half of them, to be exact. Yeah. Um, and there was a narrative that why was it good for a white government and why mm. do you want to deprive mm. a black government of mm. nuclear weapons? There was that narrative. Sure. Um, which also at the time you could understand things were quite fluid and so on. But in the world today, with the messy, complex geopolitics and influences and, you know, stuff happens. When I look back and hindsight's a great thing, mm. I think it was the absolute right thing for a democratic South Africa mm. to, to do. And I also had the immense privilege of briefing Nelson Mandela one-on-one -on, -one on this wow. topic. Okay, um, tell, tell us more about, like, uh, what, what was that moment like? Because not only are you briefing Nelson Mandela himself, yeah. but it's, it's about such a key global yeah. decision, yeah. you know, and, you know, nuclear weapons and Nelson Mandela, you can't, yeah. you can't get much more momentous yeah. than that. Um, so I was in Shalos. I was in mm. the ANC's uh, Science and Technology desk, and so mm. I worked on a range of topics. Mm. And um, I think a week before, I mean, I still think it's funny. I was about 26 years old, and there I was on the pages of the Washington Post having a debate with Buck Boerta, who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, yeah. on this topic. I mean, that was the kind of transition we were going through, right? Mm. And the truth of the matter is we knew stuff, but we made up a lot of stuff because it was <laughs> a battle for, you know, hearts and minds. Yeah. And and Pug Buerta, um up until the last moment, the government was denying the existence of these things, right? Mm. Um, and then FW said he was going to roll back South Africa's nuclear weapons program. Mm. It is the only country ever yeah. to roll back a nuclear weapons program. Get into a different debate why did it and that sort of mm, thing. Mm. The fact is, it happened. Um, and then uh, President Mandela, who was president of the ANC at the time, had to respond to this issue hmm. or engage with it. Mm. And I was the young whippersnapper who wrote the briefing memo and 
hmm. went to talk to him about about what happened. Hmm. Um, and that's a it's a big moment for me in my mind because yeah. I was twenty six or so. Um, what did he say? What was his demeanor when you went to tell him about you know? Were you telling him about the decision had been taken and now the ANC had to take its position on? Yeah, it was more a briefing on on the issues mm. and uh, a press uh, position for the press. Mm. You know? mm. um, and look, I think he, personally, I appreciated Nelson Mandela later on the journey. Okay, mm. um, And today he's his wisdom and his foresight and his leadership is something that I value more than ever with hindsight, mm. okay? Mm. And at the time, he was a very engaging person. Um, he, the reason why I was there is I held this position and I was focused on the issue. The truth of the matter is he didn't really need <laughs> what I was saying mm. because he was quite an astute, wise person. Mm. Um, and so he sat across the table and I presented to him, this is happening, this is what uh, the policy was, this is what we think we should say. Um, and it's one of those moments in my, mm. in my mind that, that stands out. I didn't see him every day, I wasn't in the presidency, I was in the sure. economics department, but those rare interactions mm. were, were quite uh, you know, mind-boggling for a 26-year-old. It's it's testament to how dynamic and vibrant the liberation movement and the ANC were at that time, mm. where young people and old people were coming together in different mm. ways. What's your theory on on what has caused the ANC to atrophy and you know become this shadow of itself when you know it it had such esteemed and exciting leadership? It had young people that mm. it could groom into the next generation, and somehow. Over time, we have an organization now which just feels lethargic. You know, I think in, in, in that period, it was a period of change and hope and everyone was young, right? Nobody had any experience in the government, mm. including the president. So it was a sure. new thing for all of us. Um, and it was more mission driven than it is today. I mean, today we've kind of settled into our style of democracy and a public service job is a career. It's a job. It's not a service necessarily. Um, there's a whole layer of civil servants who are deployed at the top and I am convinced that they actually strangle the energy of public servants. And so I would mm. start there mm. to unlock that energy in the public service. People don't go there. You know, I don't think they apply for a public service job to earn a salary and wait until they retire. Yeah. Right? That's a dynamic that, that creeps in. So I think I think we are suffering from a bit of incumbency issues here. Mm. And the you know it's it's quite absurd that people who were in the government in nineteen ninety four are still there thirty years later. Mm. You know, it, it is just impossible to have new ideas, new thinking, new energy. You get into this mindset where you've seen something, it won't work. And then you have young people coming in. And then I think another complication for us is the, the way party politics are set up. If you're a young person, you almost institutionally set up to go along to get along. Absolutely. Once you're in there, right? Yeah. So that, that freedom mm. to sort of stray outside of your lane isn't really there because you might upset some party boss. Okay. And a lot of it depends on maturity, right? Some mm. people can accept criticism or an alternative view. Others can't. It becomes about institutional power. Yeah. So I think we, we have a serious problem with incumbency, having made people quite complacent. And then, you know, we see young people going through the sausage machine and then they don't come out in, they don't show up the way you think they would mm. because mm. the institution isn't geared to unleash that kind of energy and creative thinking and that sort of thing. 
So there needs to be, I think, a rethink on uh, how political power is constituted in this country because we need we need more young people and people in general who can own their views and express them. Um, and we're not seeing that currently. You have this thing called the caucus and the party, and uh, you saw how difficult it was to have a conversation about Jacob Zuma in Parliament, absolutely, in the governing party. And I think that's the that's the dynamic that's at play. Mm. And so any change agenda, I think, can't just focus on the executive. We have to see how Parliament functions so that we can truly serve the people. Thanks for watching SMWX. Before we get back to the episode, I just wanted to let you know the four ways that you can help support this channel if you want to see us growing bigger and better to keep you more entertained and informed. The first way is you can invite me to speak at your company, your school, your institution. You'll see the contact details down below. The second way is that you can become a member of this channel. Become a member or you can give us a thanks. You'll see there's like a heart with a dollar sign in the ribbon below this video. Buy me and the team some coffee for this episode. The third way you can get involved is you can advertise on the channel. Now, I'd much rather the community of viewers would be advertisers on this channel than me going out to people who don't really know about SMWX and trying to explain it to them. So if you're a viewer and you have a business and you want to partner and you love this platform, let's partner on this channel. And then finally, you can buy merchandise, you can buy books. All this is in the description down below. Now let's get back to the episode. On that note, what do you make of President Ramaphosa's term? Because of course he rose on a crest of optimism and presumably the fact that you've started change starts now means that you, you know, you yourself have become disenchanted. How do you weigh up whether President Cyril Ramaphosa has the wherewithal to turn the ship around and, and you know, maybe not in his first term, but I guess his argument now in, is in his second term, mm. um, if we give him just a bit more time, you know, the, the wheels will start to turn and his agenda will already start to see fruition. So I think, I believe it's really important that you cannot, you cannot conceive an idea based on grievance because grievance is going to take you nowhere, right? So so my personal decision has less to do with being disenchanted mm. and more to do with the society that we can be. Um, and I think we need to be focusing on that. Now, I've been asked this question, why has President Ramaphosa disappointed us in his first term? And what's the outlook? Mm. I think the the... We all underestimated the grip of the party on the president. You know, in in Barack Obama's uh, book, A Promised Land, um, he talks about the limitations of the presidency. It's actually a fascinating read, if you yeah. haven't. Mm. And he says he very quickly realized when he became president, mm. he thought he was hopping on a speedboat. And then he realized he's actually on, a, on an aircraft carrier with a thousand soldiers, uh, um, seamen uh, and him on the bridge and the only way this was going to change course is if he could convince these sailors who know what they're doing to change course but he wasn't going to change course on his own up there. Mm. and i think the problem we are seeing with the president is the party grip on him i mean on the weekend he spoke about cater deployment and BE and that sort of thing. And he claimed, he, he claimed the, uh, the head of the Constitutional Court, judge, uh, the judge, mm. and the deputy judge as projects of the ANC. Mm. Mm. Now, it's absurd to, to even go there, right? Um, if you're talking about the independence of the judiciary and that sort of thing. Um, so I believe that's been a serious limitation on his presidency, which will not change in his second term if he gets one, because there are all sorts of dynamics at play. Um, essentially, he can't be his own man in that party political 
his own person in that party political setup because of all of those handbrakes, those political handbrakes that are at play. And, and now he's starting to own that narrative mm. also. He's owning the stuff like the common, the reference I just made there. So I don't think he needs more time. He, if we have more of the same, which I've been saying, we're going to have a very different conversation in 2029. Mm. Mm. Uh, and in fact, in the state of the nation, what was quite odd, I think, for a sitting president, you know, when you give your account, I think, to the nation after a term, you start with when you started in office and what you undertook to do, and then you end with what you achieved and what the shortcomings were and what you're going to do differently mm. and better. Our president started in 1994. He, he took a 30-year <laughs> A 30-year snapshot, and he told us um, we've doubled the number of employed between 1994 and 2024. Uh, very disingenuous, in my view. Mm. Mm. But I think it's it's the limitations of the institution that's that's limiting his ability to serve. Let's talk about the the change charter, your manifesto, which you've recently produced, and of course. With change starts now, which is which is the platform uh, that you've launched recently too. What strikes me about the manifesto that's different from other manifestos is that you first answer the question, "Where are we going to get money to do the things that we say we're going to do?" Which is quite <laughs> well, it's refreshing to the extent that at least someone's thinking about the fact yeah. that revenue is one of the key necessities for a new government and a new administration. We need to find that money. So talk us through this plan to to find money to spend on key, you know, we'll talk about where you want to spend it. But how do we get money at this point when our state is ailing and, and our debt is spiraling? So we have to start there. And uh, the the change charter is really based on the fact that we have a, a rapidly deteriorating social condition in this country. And we cannot afford to say, let's wait until we grow and improve before we deal with hunger in this country, sure. or malnutrition, or homelessness, or crime. We need to intervene urgently. So how do we intervene urgently without incurring more debt? We know that uh, our national income is just being depleted because our companies aren't growing. It's putting stress and strain on the balance sheet of, of South Africa. And we're seeing that coming out in various cuts, okay? Mm, mm. Budgetary cuts. Because now we can't sustain our hospitals, we can't sustain things. Mm. Uh, this budget has just gone for the 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 G Freca, mm. the, the reserve. Um so we, we want to tackle how do we resource this. Now, there, there are two legs to that. But the overlay is we need to solve infrastructure and we need to solve social, constitutionally enshrined social guarantees we have to stick to. So how do we deal with this, right? Um, we, we have two legs to this. Our state on enterprises, it's basically ground zero in the bankruptcy of this country, <laughs> okay? The continued feeding of these enterprises with no clear plan. Mm. And when plans do emerge, they don't get implemented. And we can mm. get into why. Mm. Absolutely. So plans on ESCOM have been around forever. Restructuring ESCOM's balance sheet, uh, creating a distribution generation and transmission company. It's been around for forever. It just hasn't happened. Um, our modeling shows that if we can fix ESCOM and Transnet and the others, just with the underlying profitability, we can leverage about a trillion rand, which can be used to fund some of the things we're talking about. And then secondly, it's, it's plain for everyone to see. At the current rate, there will be tax increases into the future on a sustainable basis. Where are we going to get the money from? Sure. Debt and tax. Tax rates have come down a lot yeah. over the last 30 years as well. Yeah, so we're going to have to go more borrowing, more tax. 
we've put in place a temporary three-year plan sure. to raise 500 billion rand. That 500 billion rand, and we know that taxpayers are really just beleaguered mm. because they don't know where their tax money goes. And if you're a taxpayer, you probably have private health care, private security, private everything. Mm. So you're not even benefiting from your tax spend. And where that spend goes into public goods like schools and hospitals, it's just falling over. So we're ring fencing the 500 billion. Um, we will need an act of parliament mm. to do that as per the constitution. And we'll put the good and the great, a proper public private partnership mm. panel with a very eminent chair so that a taxpayer who's paying into that fund can see where their money is going. Mm. So there'll be line of sight there. So the 500 billion comes from uh, what we're calling a social solidarity fund. And the reason why we calling it that is we feel it's not sustainable to have a situation in which we have extremely poor people side by side with extremely wealthy people and we're calling on the rich to make common cause with the poor in a three-year limited period a levy and we've broken that down into how we think it uh, works we've modeled it extensively and the 500 billion with a trillion that we can unlock through leverage by fixing the SOEs, we'll have one and a half trillion rand. Over and above that, the National Development Plan, which came out in 2012, called for infrastructure investment as a percentage of GDP to go to 30%, and in so doing to bring unemployment down to 10%. That hasn't happened. We're sitting at about 14, 14.5%. Kenya's at 20%. Other countries, there's a litany of them who are approaching 30 and so on. Our modeling shows that if we can get to 22% mm. infrastructure spend to GDP, we can cut unemployment by 37%. So we've looked at the detail, and our, our manifesto isn't one of sentiment. We specifically wanted to address how do we achieve that. And that's why you're seeing... a. Mm. the fix. I think we call it the courageous fix. Um, that should get us on a growth path. ESCOM. If ESCOM is fixed, our GDP growth can go from 1%-ish to 2.5%. And with that comes jobs. This is not rocket science. It's known. The question is, why is not it happening? And it's not happening because of deep political dysfunction. And we need to get fresh energy, uh, the bright, the best and the brightest in the room to be able to deliver on these things. And we think we can. And how do we go about this best and the brightest into the room? Because I think that's also quite a, an underlying theme of mm -hmm. a lot of what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, even in your manifesto, you do something quite rare where you say, we agree with a lot of what's out there already. Mm -hmm. We're not yeah. here to fight everything. Yeah. But what we're saying is that if we can get the best people into the room to implement this, then, you know, our country will take off. You know, I was quite struck. There's this debate going on about cater deployment at the moment yeah. with what the DA mm -hmm. has, has been fighting on in various courts. And for all one can criticize the DA and defend the idea of political appointments, which, of course, are mm -hmm. natural in, in, in a democracy. It did strike me that there is such a stranglehold on appointments all over the state, not, not just in traditionally mm. political places, but just in mundane, yeah. you know, you, it's virtually mm. all the way down in, in an organization. How would you try to uproot that? Because of course it's important to get the right people in the right places, but I'd imagine it's actually quite a difficult thing to achieve in practice. Yeah, so, so in our clearly thought out plans. They, we, we mustn't leave anyone with the impression that this is a easy, quick uh, route. Um, let's take an example where the rubber hits the road. And cater deployment is the evil twin of public procurement, the way it's been done. There are so many projects where People have been given tenders to put water infrastructure in places, in villages and that sort of thing. 
And those tenders are awarded sometimes three times over, and the water just never materialized. So how you, and governments all over the world employ strategic procurement as a government policy lever. It's not new, it's mm. done. When it fails to deliver the goods, you have to take another look and ask yourself, is this working? Mm. Now, you, you have examples, take NESFAS, for example. There's no reason why students should be suffering and not get their grants paid on time and get less money because somebody's clipping fees along the way mm. and they're ill-equipped to actually deal with this, right? So now the government is saying they're going to talk to the banks. South Africa has one of the most developed payment systems in the world. And that applies to pension payouts, student, whatever. You have a myriad of companies in this country with bona fide black shareholders, okay? Shareholders who have taken risk capital and invested in these, let's call them legacy companies because they've been around forever. Mm. They still don't get included in these major tenders three guys in a fax machine, get a huge tender. We call it inclusion. And then as Ricardo Hausman at Harvard pointed out, we don't count people who are excluded from the service. We just count the three or four guys who now made mm. the big mm. bucks. So we need to rethink that. At the public sector level, the leadership there, where there are blockages, we'll have to identify them and you know, they say if you can't change the people, you must change the people. Uh, so there will have to be some tough decisions there. But this isn't a blanket statement about the whole public service. As a former public servant, mm. um, I know that there are really good people there who are just pulling their hair out because of the ceiling that they're having to deal with all the time. So it's something you have to tackle head on so that you can unlock that, that uh, pent up energy in the public service. I don't think a nurse goes to a public hospital to kill patients. I mean, they are outliers, right? But mm, mm. they don't have medicine, they don't have sanitizer, the porters aren't working. The whole place becomes debilitated. Short staff and doctors, 800 new, newly qualified doctors sit at home. And then there's a knee jerk when it becomes public. Um, so it's, it's quite absurd that we can have such a sophisticated private sector existing alongside a rapidly declining public sector. And the other aspect of social solidarity is in the interim, we will have to leverage that private sector capability and resources. Mm. Um, or we can become slaves to ideology and say, no, it's the private sector, which, which yeah. isn't sensible. Well, there's some interesting balances of those two imperatives in the manifesto where the ports, for example, where I was reading, I was thinking, oh, now you're just going to go privatize the ports. And then mm -hmm. you say, actually, hold on, we're going to, we're going to hand them over to private players, but the state will still retain that. So we're going to lease them. Yeah. The state will retain ownership, but not just lease them. After a certain period, they must be brought back right. into the state. Yeah. So you're proposing this kind of buffer period where yeah. we're going to bring in private sector know-how, but with the long-term view of greater state capacity and ultimately the state retaining those assets. And that's that's an interesting way of balancing mm. these these two extremes of either the state must own everything now or privatize everything yeah. now. It's not binary. And I think if your starting point is ideology, then you get into that binary argument. Um, the starting point has to be, what is the best solution to solve the problem now? And that best solution could be the private sector, it could be the public sector, what is the best solution? And it always invites the conversation that you now want to auction off the family jewels. Mm -hmm. They're not jewels anyway, anymore, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right? for sure, yeah. And so the model we've come up with is, let's get people in there who know what they're doing. Let's, this is about, the farmer who wants to get his product to the port to export so that he can sustain jobs on his or her farm or the manufacturer um, on the East Rand, you know? Uh, how do we make our economy 
competitive and how do we get our goods to market? Currently, all these ships are passing the Cape, right? Because mm. of mm. what's happening in the Suez Canal. Yeah. We're not capitalizing on those ships passing by because absolutely that capacity has been decimated. I mean, what an opportunity we could have had. What an opportunity. And how many what an opportunities mm. have we had in the last Commodity thing? booms we, we can't we must capitalize it. on. Exactly, yeah. right? So, and on the port thing, Djibouti, okay, which has a, a GDP 0.8% of ours, is ranked 26. Now, yeah, yeah <laughs> for now. <laughs> they rank 26 out of 370 in terms of port competitivity. Hmm. Our major ports are, out of 370, we are 365-ish. Hmm. I mean, it's crazy. Wow, it's I didn't insane. it was that. that it big. is dire, yeah. you know? And there's no reason for why we should be on our knees hmm. in this way with all the capability around us. Hmm. We, we just need the world to harvest that and we need to park this ideological lens because hmm. We're going to get goods and services, public goods to our people by being broad-minded about how we're going to get it. In terms of some of the, the politics of, of the moment, um, change starts now. I feel like you've been on an absolute media roller coaster over the last few months. One minute you were going to be president, yeah. you know, within, a, you know, tomorrow. Right. Um, and then the next minute change starts now is, you know, finished and nothing is, and, and there's a very extreme narrative that seems mm. to be building around either, either this is the ultimate or this is the, the worst. Mm. Um, what has that kind of media cycle been like for you? I mean, what was it like when all the papers were saying Roger Jardine's going to be president tomorrow? And what's it like when people write you off? <laughs> so look. We, we, we do not have a presidential electoral system <laughs> in this country. Yeah, you okay? could have fooled me with some of our narratives. Yeah, you know, so so it was very interesting to me to, I mean, like readers of Sunday newspapers, I also woke up to mm. a front page story, um, uh, who I'm talking to and where it's going and that sort of thing. Mm. I think that's par for the course. Look, I'm not a career politician, so some things do take my breath away. Um, and the swing in, in the narrative. But let's get back to first principles, right? Why did I make this decision? Mm. Um, I felt that this election is an important one. And in being institutionally bound, I couldn't express myself as a South African. And by leaving an institution, I basically freed myself up to say how I feel about the current governing party, how I feel about the state of society. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's been a, a very fulfilling journey, a very short journey. Sure. Um, and, you know, the, the analysts have had their own things to say. We've produced a manifesto, and I think we must engage. That's our vision for society, mm. okay? The rest is sort of, it's props. Um, I don't think the idea, I mean, okay, so I was the chairman of a major financial institution, so it lends itself to the business texture, and I get all of that stuff, right? Mm. Um, but our manifesto is very clear in terms of where we see the urgency in our society. Um, so there is a view that we left it too late. The elections are in May. Mm. Um, mm. There's all sorts of views around change starts now and um, where we're heading. Mm. Our team has been very clear, and that's why we assembled such an amazing team. There needs to be a voice in society that we, we cannot just have the same choices all the time. And so in whatever form, we are crafting a different narrative and we're asking South Africans to engage with this narrative. And that could be electorally or not electorally, but either way, South Africa needs, it, we need a vision, right? We don't talk about who we are as South Africans. We've been talking for the last 10 years about state capture, Zuma, tenders, load shedding. And these are all important things, but who are we as South Africans? What does it mean to be a South African, right? 
My personal view is, you know, back in the post-94 period, we spoke about unity and diversity. We, we went there. We had that mm. conversation as imperfect as it may have been mm. for a generation today. But in 2024, we need that coalescing around a South African consciousness. How do we allow ourselves to enjoy our foods and our languages and all of those good things? And then we say, in our consciousness, this is who we are. Mm. We cannot reduce it simply to when we win a World Cup or, or a sports tournament. It has to be a vibrant, organic thing. And so when we say the rich must make common cause with the poor, it speaks to the society that we want to be and that we should be uh, thinking of. So, so for, for me personally, being part of this conversation is a very important thing. Mm. Every election for the last three elections, I've watched. Our family is deeply political, so we have town hall meetings around election time <laughs> intergenerationally. Mm. We debate things. The young people tell us what's wrong with the choices we mm. made. Mm. And one year we actually had a mock poll mm. um, where we voted. And, and it, it was exactly, it mirrored the national poll, wow. by the way. Wow. Um, we had about 10 nieces and nephews who were mm. all first and second year yeah. at university. Yeah. And they obviously went a certain route at the time, <laughs> right? Um, so, so wanting to be part of that conversation um, is very important. I mean, look, I've, I've held very important or very key institutional roles in mm. my career. Mm. Um, so I'm not enthralled by stuff. Uh, at this stage in, in my life where I'm an active South African citizen, I'm looking at what is the conversation we need to be having and how do we get from where we are to where we need to be? And I think every South African should be part of that. I mean, we, we, we are all agents of that. And that's why we talk about citizens more than we talk about voters. Because for that brief window, we all become voters and then nothing after. Mm. So how do we continue engaging with that in wherever we find ourselves? And so change starts now has been a phenomenal vehicle. We've put together a diverse group of people who share one thing, and that's how do we make South Africa a better place for all of us. In terms of the criticism of leaving it too late, there are certain just administrative aspects of an election that yeah. seem to be um, hamstringing many of the new entrants yeah. who, who are worried about the signature requirement and just being able to get on the ballot. Are you mm. confident that you will be able to clear those hurdles so that you actually will be able to give South Africans that opportunity for for making yeah. a decision one way or the other? So, so we're confident we can do that. However, we've and I've said this repeatedly, the progressive opposition in this country needs to think about how we coalesce pre or post election. Mm. And there are lots of conversations happening um, around that. Mm. And I think for Change Starts Now, we very pragmatic. I mean, we, we teeing up to do this. Mm. Um, the question is, do we do it before or after the election? That runway is basically coming to an end, right? Because of the sure. timetable that you're alluding to. Yeah, sure. Um, but we've put all the, the systems in place to be able to meet those obligations. Mm. But we, we, we can make a call that we team up with somebody. Mm. You know, mm. it's a, everybody's been saying this, you left it too late, what about smaller parties, etc. It is consequential if it's just about power. Mm. But if it's about changing the narrative, getting different voices in parliament, then you look at it through a different mm. lens. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what are, the, what are the scenarios of what that looks like of, of a progressive opposition coalescing and, and that really seems to be the core of your project of course change starts now is is the vehicle through which yeah. you hope to make it happen but you seem to be seeing change starts now as one piece in a bigger um, movement as it were i mean if the oppo progressive opposition were to coalesce what do you what do you think that could look like or what ideally would that look like to you 
I think any any conversation, and that's why our manifesto is very important. Coalitions tend to be based on arithmetic. Mm. Okay, after an election, sure. you count up the votes and then you you, you share the spoils. Okay. Mm. The, the correct way is to talk about a platform and a vision for society, however large or small you may be, because that voice has been missing. Sure. And so I think a conversation around coalescing is agreeing, getting the diagnosis right and the actions that need to be taken. And then you can have a conversation on who runs, who gets what. Mm. But that is a distant second conversation to have yeah yeah absolutely well we we look forward to seeing how those uh conversations pan out but uh roger jardine thank you very much for joining us on smwx and uh, we hope this isn't the last time you join us on this platform thank you very much thanks for having me and i'll cook for you sometime oh yeah well i hope so i hope so as long as we're not playing rugby then it's fine <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>